Hello and welcome to another episode of First Takes. I'm Michelle Mayo. Jack Graham is an actor, singer-songwriter well known to fans of the Pashaka Shah series and Living Room Theater. Madeline Potts is an artist, musician, and master storyteller. They both radiate love and kindness and have become a kind of antidote to whatever negative energy the world throws at us. I hope you enjoy tonight's very special show with Jack Graham and Madeline Potts. Turn the TV off, come outside with me. Let's take a walk. There's a moon to see, I want to be with you. Before the movie starts, the show begins, the baby cries, the whole day ends, I want to be with you. Before the sun comes up, the lights go down, while the miles go by, another year goes round. Won't you go with me? Oh, come with me. It's been a long time. Got a long time to go. While our dinner bakes, yes, I ate them all after he graduates. The leaves all fall, I want to be with you While we choose a film, remember him Call up old friends, see them again I want to be with you Won't you come with me? As the judgment's made Time has come for the last long breath and the siren song. I want to be with you. Won't you come with me? It's been a long time. I'm glad you were here. I'm glad that you're here. I'm so glad. You're still here with me. We were culinary Jews. The core of my religious education was cheese blintzes and potato knishes and chicken noodle soup with matzo balls. Well, the temple was really the kitchen. That's where my mother presided as the grand rabbi, simmering and stewing and serving up sermons of stuffed cabbage and delicious foods for her congregants, her husband, and her children. I knew a little more about our religion than just what we ate, I knew how to bless the Sabbath candles. I knew the names of all the important holidays and what they stood for. But my parents didn't regularly go to the synagogue, or the shul, as we would call it. That was reserved mainly for bar mitzvahs and weddings. And I think the reason that they didn't go was because neither of them knew how to read Hebrew and that embarrassed them. I lived on East 29th Street in Brooklyn, in a brick row house, and our neighborhood was ethnically diverse. But a few years after we moved in there, the house next to us went for sale, and lo and behold, a Jewish family moved in next door. Up until then, we were the only Jews on the block. My mother used to insist that I get dressed up on Saturdays to show respect for my religion, even though we weren't going to the synagogue. And then she insisted I get dressed up on Sundays 
to show respect for my Christian neighbors. I was always dressed up. The only pair of jeans I had, which we called dungarees back then, were bought for my one summer at Camp Well Met, a sleepaway Jewish camp in the Catskill Mountains. But eventually, another Jewish family moved in, coincidentally, right next door. And even more coincidentally, they had a daughter, Linda, and she was just my age and in my grade. And we walked to school together and we played after school and we became very good friends. Now, Linda's family was even less religious than mine. But her mother shared my mother's mentality about dressing up to show respect. And so it came about the end of September one year. It was the middle of the week, and it was the Jewish holiday of Rosh Hashanah. We were all dressed up and sitting on the stoop with nothing to do. We had coordinated our outfits. I had a black skirt and a white sweater, and I had a little red neckerchief tied around my neck. Linda had one, too. We found them in a cardboard bargain box at the drugstore around the corner. And I had my very first pair of high heels. They weren't really high heels. They were about an inch and a half regular heels, but that was higher than anything I ever wore, and so it qualified. I felt like the cat's meow. I went outside, and I met Linda, and we sat down on the stoop, and she was all dressed up in her outfit that matched mine, and she said, what do people do on Rosh Hashanah? I answered knowingly, go to shul. Well, Where's the shul, she said. I thought about it. I knew where there was a shul. It was a long walk, but I knew where it was. I had gone to a bar mitzvah there. We decided that we should go to shul. Oh, it was a glorious, self-righteous decision. We got up and started walking. I felt so good. I was following in the footsteps of my ancestors. I was going to shul on Rosh Hashanah. Of course, my new shoes were not the best thing for walking to shul, but it was okay. We persevered, and finally, we got there. Now what? The street was empty. The synagogue covered a whole corner. It was a three-story building of yellow brick. It had wide steps leading up to two austere wooden doors. We climbed the steps. The doors were closed. We leaned our ears against the wood. We could hear men's voices chanting inside and the rabbi singing his prayers in mournful minor intervals. And as we stood there with our ears pressed against those great doors, a policeman came walking around the corner. He was all dressed in black. He was kind of portly. It looked like his arms didn't want to go all the way down to his sides, and he thrust his feet slightly sideways as he walked, like he was trying to get out of the way of his own thighs. He stopped when he saw us. What are you girls doing up there? We ran down the steps. Oh, well, we came to go to shul. Are you Jewish? Mm-hmm. He looked up and down the street, and he smiled at us. And as young as I was, not even understanding it, I knew there was something wrong with that smile. It wasn't warm and friendly. He came even closer till his face was almost near us, and he looked at us and said, You know what those red neckerchiefs mean? We didn't have the faintest idea they meant anything. He said, women wear them to let men know. Know what? 
Linda looked at me, I looked at her. He said, to let them know that they are women of the night. Women of the night? What does that mean? Prostitutes. <gasps> we knew that word. We had a pretty good idea of what that meant. The moment was intensely uncomfortable. I didn't know what to say. Linda was a little bit more worldly than me. She grabbed my arm and she said, we need to go home right now. We turned around and started walking. We must have gone three blocks without saying a word before I finally had the courage to stop and look over my shoulder and make sure we weren't followed. My shoes had become excruciating, but I didn't dare take them off and walk in my stocking feet because my mother had warned me, those stockings have to last through three days of the Jewish holidays, so you have to take care of them. And to make matters worse, this was long before pantyhose had been invented. I was wearing a garter belt with long elastic straps that had already pinched off the little fine hairs off of my thighs. And I was working on growing a rash. We walked along in silence. I never heard what he said. I don't think it's true, Linda said. I don't think it's true either. Nevertheless, as we walked, I found my hand going up to the knot of the neckerchief, and I slowly undid it and pulled it off. I crumpled it up and held it in my hand as if I was embarrassed to let anyone see what I had and what I had been wearing. We walked the rest of the way in silence. When I got home, I ran upstairs to my room. I took that neckerchief, I folded it up, and I put it way in the back of my dresser drawer. I never told my mother what happened that day. I was pretty sure that he was just having a good time with us at our expense. But just in case... I never wore that red neckerchief ever again. Well, so I wrote a new one um, about having a rather lusty dream. Yep. Um, Happens to us all, kid. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, I got to explore that more than I thought I was going to, so it's really good. And there's a moment where you wake up and establish that it's in a dream, mm -hmm. which makes it all okay. Yes, right? I don't know what I'm gonna do I lose my head when I'm with you I know you have somebody too Like me you always will be true I can't stop thinking about you So easy for you to inspire I hear you sing and I'm on fire You say the things that I admire I'm not immune to your desire Can't stop thinking about you I see you coming And I wait I hear you calling And I hesitate Because I know that it is true I'd break the rules to be beside you I'd give my life to make us two Not really what I want to do I can't stop thinking about you then I wake up in a cold sweat and hear you softly breathe. It's warm and cozy in our bed, no reason to deceive. And I shake off the madness from the sleeping world. And I remember you're a very special girl.
Your body's warmer than the sun A playground meant for lots of fun When you're around I come undone Lasers always set on stun I can't stop thinking about you You laugh and make me look away I love this painful kind of play I couldn't do this every day Prostration does get in the way I can't stop thinking about you I smell the ocean in the moonlight I justify that it be all right Never ending is this night My mind is spinning out in flight I can't stop thinking about you I taste your dark chocolate eyes I feel your song as we arrive Your sheets are warm and disappear As you are blocking both my ears I want to scream that I love you And thank you for the things you do I'm glad there won't be any tears And we can meet this way for years Honey, I'm tired, how? Good night. So you mentioned that you play the accordion. I do. And do you ever play with Jack and tell stories? Or Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, when Jack and I get together to rehearse, mm -hmm. <laughs> We can we can rehearse from seven o'clock at night till two o'clock in the morning, and then when we're saying goodbye, I go oh, we were having so much fun playing songs, we forgot to rehearse the show. You can come, you can come I have what you need and I'll give you some You can stay, you can stay I'll make sure you're good till you go away Have a beautiful feel Your presence makes everything real I leave our time today Full grown, I don't want to go home Don't say a word Don't say a word Your voice threatens me Yes, I know it's absurd the moon is high The moon is high It colors your skin and makes me fly I'm not gonna start again There's no time to start with a new friend I leave this ceremony alone I don't wanna go home I no longer wonder what's happening Time's an illusion, we're way past the spring The peacocks are singing with their screams I often lie awake in the middle of a dream There's only enough love to keep us real There is no confusion that we need to feel The truth is a friend doesn't have to be shared I think you know it's important that you care
You can come. You can come. I have what you need, and I'll give you some. You can stay. Oh, please stay. I'll make sure you're good till you go away. You have a beautiful feel. Your presence makes everything real. I leave our time today full grown. I don't. I don't. I don't want to. I would call myself a traditional teller. Why? What does that mean? Um, crafted stories. And when you say crafted, what, is, what exactly does that mean? That you've written it all out? Yes. I write my stories mm -hmm. out. I don't memorize them. Well, I do memorize them, but I don't try and tell them word for word. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you, you have know, these points? I do. There right. are certain things that I want to cover in order of events. And then every now and then I just stumble on some words that, that occur to me that I go, ooh, that's nice. i got to remember, remember to put that. that in. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but I think for me the biggest trick is getting on stage, smiling at the audience, and feeling like we're ready to party together. And then just living in the story. Just since so many of my stories are personal narrative based on my life, you know, okay. I can just sink back into that experience and into the feeling of it, especially mm -hmm. when I'm telling stories about my childhood. Sometimes I think there's something better Like putting on my favorite sweater It doesn't take much to make me happy Always a rush, only to be crappy I need to know there's a place I can go Where I'm wanted Sometimes I feel like tending gardens I can recall from kindergarten what it felt like to make a new friend and how summer came to a quick end I need to know it's a place to go where I'm needed it seems that I've been around when things were grounded and what you heard was always founded in the truth that you knew and you could trust it most of the time not readjusted I need to know it's a place to go where I'm singing yeah, there's a place where I can go where everyone is all aglow at the still house at the still house Have you ever met the bar pretender? I'm looking for a winter romance I need Mrs. Claus's self-care Or a sidecar named Desire I'm gonna carry the scarlet touch To light my way to the Zanzibar The best one is the man with the bag No, I'm just kidding, it's Really, you at the still house, at the still house. Come in, the smile tells me, I love you, whispers the sound. In here, it's cool and caring, you can feel it all around. There's bounty for our dinner. Like a waltz from Richard Strauss And everyone's a winner While we're at the still house 
You are freaking beautiful. Your voice is like a song. Your very presence musical. And everyone sings along. Come and spend some time with me. I missed you since last year. Saw you at the blue bamboo. Heard your laugh so clear. Now the kids are older. The lights are so pretty. Colorful and comfortable. I'm glad you're here with me. You wait your turn so gracefully. There's welcome anticipation. And waiting is a gift when you can share a story at the still house. And waiting is a gift when you can share your story at the still house. We did a living room theater at Madeline's house, and okay. it was in the room uh, at the back of her house where there's a little performance area. And uh, as I noticed right away as we were getting set up, I didn't really know her very well at that point. Um, I was just asking her questions, and I thought, okay, this, this is real. We have a strong connection just right off the bat. I think it uh, revolved around Frank Zappa album covers in her art collection. Really? Was first. <laughs> And uh, ever since then, our relationship's grown in a way that allows, allows me to, to uh, write songs and to be focused on the next, the next show that we're going to do mm -hmm. and all of that. So, yeah, she's uh, quite a, a musician as well. Right. And I like to push her out of her comfort zone and, and have her sing things she normally wouldn't mm -hmm. even. The most exciting thing that I could do on a Saturday afternoon was go to the movies with my friend Linda. Oh, the movies were so much fun back then, but it wasn't really the main feature that we loved. It was the candy and the cartoons. My mother kept a jar of coins on the windowsill in the kitchen, and I was allowed to help myself to coins for lunch money for school or for school needs or for the good humor man when we heard his bells tinkling their way down the street, and also for the movies on Saturday afternoon. 65 cents was a windfall. That would account for 35 cents for an under age 12 ticket into the movies, 20 cents for bus fare, 10 cents each way, going up and down Avenue U because the theater was about a mile and a half away and 10 cents left over for candy. It didn't take long before Linda and I figured out that if we walked to the theater, we could have twice as much money for candy. And so it was a day, a crisp day in early December. Linda and I were walking down the avenue to go to the movies. We were taking our time Back then, we didn't concern ourselves with show times. We just got there when we got there. And if it was in the middle of a movie, we sat down and watched it. And when the movie was over, we stayed in our seats till it started again and left when we got caught up to where we had walked in. The best part about going to the movies was not the feature. It was the cartoons. My favorite was Mr. Magoo, and all his misadventures were based on the fact that he was nearly blind. And I know in today's world, that's an insensitive way to treat children's humor. But it was the 50s. We thought it was hilarious. But we also thought that Elmer Fudd's speech impediment, I do it, I do it, a putty cat, was endlessly amusing. And for violence... Well, the violence was mild-mannered and also comical, like every time Felix the cat got his tail tied to an exploding cannonball. And for suspense and drama, 
you couldn't beat the mild-mannered detective Charlie Chan and his five numbered sons. So, it had been a very satisfying afternoon at the movies. We had walked there, and when it was over, I was surprised as we exited the theater how gray the sky was. There was even a little bit of snow flurry activity happening. We walked over to the bus stop. Linda fished around in her pocket for her dime fare. She boarded the bus. I didn't have to fish around for my dime. I knew perfectly well where it was. In the cash register of the candy counter inside the Avenue U Theater, I had spent all my transportation money on candy. Don't worry about me. You go. I'm just going to walk home. Okay, she said. The doors of the bus closed, and it took off down the avenue. Almost immediately, the weather turned wetter and more harsh. The temperature was dropping by the minute. It didn't take long before my nose was stinging and my toes and fingers began to feel numb. I stopped at each store awning and waited for a minute, hoping the weather would let up, but when I saw it was only getting worse, I just continued. At one point, I stepped off the street and landed in a puddle, an icy cold puddle. My feet, my shoes, my socks were instantly freezing. There was nothing to do. I couldn't even pull them up out of my shoes. They were so wet and uncomfortable. At one point, though, I caught my reflection in a store window. My whole head was covered with snow and my shoulders. I look like an angel. Well, when you're young, the door to make believe is always open. Without a moment's thought or self-consciousness, I lifted my arms and I began to skip step down the street, pretending I was an angel flying. And I kept that up till I got to the corner and had to wait for the light to change amid a group of some very serious looking grown-ups. The atmosphere had changed, too. There was a sense of urgency. Pedestrians and motorists were rushing to get to their destinations ahead of this coming storm. I was really cold and really wet. And I was really sorry I had spent all my money on candy. But there was nothing to do except continue walking. So I buckled down to it, and I walked as fast as I could. And finally, I reached home. I climbed carefully up the brick steps of my stoop, which was already covered with snow that was getting a little icy. And I let myself in. My mother called out, is that you, Madeline? Yes, Mom, I'll be right there. I kicked off my wet shoes. I ran upstairs and took off my wet socks. I draped them over the edge of the bathtub and put on a pair of dry socks. Oh, they felt so good. And then I took a towel and tried to dry my hair a little bit. And I went down into the kitchen. Normally, my mother would ask me about my afternoon. Where did you go? What did you see? Who went with you? Did you see any of your friends from school? But on this day, she was totally silent. She didn't ask a single question. I began to get nervous. This was unusual and very uncomfortable, so I began to kind of babble. Oh, we had such a good time, Mommy. You know, it was so nice. You know what? There were four cartoons. There were two Daffy Ducks and two Mr. Magoos. And she turned around and said, I know. Linda came over. She wanted to see if you made it home OK. And she told me all about it. Oh. That Linda, she spilled the beans. 
but I didn't know how many beans she had spilled. So I was afraid to say anything for fear of giving out any more detrimental information. I just sat there with my wet head and drenched in guilt while my mother glared at me. And then she said, three candy bars, Madeline, three candy bars. And she was just about to launch into what I knew was going to be a, an incredible tirade. And I was saved by the bell. Literally, I was saved by the bell. Ping, the kitchen timer went off. My mother was distracted. She looked at it. She opened the oven door and peered in. Then she grabbed a dish towel and holding it by either end, she used it like a pair of pot holders and retrieved a pan of roasted chicken parts and put it on the table. She was just about to resume her reprimand when we heard the door open. It was my father coming home from work. She shook her head. Oh, just set the table. Oh, I was so injured by her disapproval. I ate everything on my plate that night, even my mother's horrible overcooked string beans. I was working so hard to get back in her good graces. But she was cold and non-communicative throughout the whole dinner. When we finished our meal, I helped clear the dishes and put them in the sink. Then I sat back down while my mother went to the refrigerator and retrieved a tray of little pudding cups, chocolate pudding, with marshmallows melted on the top, one of my favorites. She handed one to my father. She placed one at her seating. And then she gave all my siblings a portion. I sat there quietly. She looked at me. A little smile broke on her face. She handed me the last cup, and I knew I was forgiven. Here is peace and darkness Here it's cool and informed Many stores between the arches And candy and popcorn And you can go to Mars in here And own your very own farm You could even kill somebody Never worry of harm here is Bugs and Mr. Magoo, 13 blocks between here and bed. Bedford Avenue and Avenue U is where I feed my head. You could climb Mount Everest and fall in love each day. Change is as good as the rest, so get out of your own way. And you could find Andy Warhol and have drinks with Marilyn Monroe. Join the Yankees for baseball and ride along with the Pope. Here is Bugs and Mr. Magoo, 13 blocks between here and bed. Bedford Avenue and Avenue U is where I feed my head. Soon I'll step out into the rain Trying to get home quick Skipping, pretending that I could fly As the snow begins to stick Here's Bugs and Mr. Magoo Thirteen blocks between here and bed Bedford Avenue and Avenue U Is where I feed my So, Madeline, yes. tell me about the world of storytelling and tell me about how you found it or it found you and, and other aspects of it. I found it accidentally. I was in an automobile accident and uh, I wasn't really hurt. I was just a little shook up. 
but I spent a whole day at home and I didn't want to listen to music and then I thought, I want someone to tell me a story. And I <laughs> went online and that's when I discovered storytelling. But I had actually been writing children's music before that, oh. which is kind of telling stories yep. set to music. And then I found out that there was a local storytelling guild, and the meeting was the very next night. Mm -hmm. So I showed up, and that was it. It was uh -huh. love at first sight. Where does it start? Right where it ends. I'm glad you're here. 
of your circle of friends You're doing just fine It's all in good time Everything ends Love your circle of friends I want to see you and watch you smile I want to listen to you for a while I want to hug you and tell you it's real I want to be with you It's just how I feel So what do you think? I propose a drink Our time sure did shrink Love your circle of friends For now this will do Oh, I love you Despite what transcends Love your circle of friends Thanks for watching. Please join us next time for another episode of First Takes. I'm Michelle Mayo.